Good morning. We are beginning, or actually in the second Sunday, of a simple summer theme that lasts just a few weeks. One way to introduce it is, first of all, you know, so often in life, the case is not so much for God knowing what you are to do, it's finding the strength to do it. In the first few weeks of the summer, we are blessed to be able to focus on God's Word and also be reminded that God's Word does possess God's power. And to illustrate that, I offer a little video, short video offered by our church body, the Wisconsin Synod, to be used in a variety of ways of advertising. It's pretty fast, but what you will see is pictures connected to the words of the Lord Jesus, illustrating God's Word has God's power. Short, to the point, perhaps too fast. At the same time, a simple link we may very well use to try to communicate and pass along an invitation for folks to listen. Oh, listen with open hearts and minds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We celebrate God's word possesses his power, even to crush evil today. God bless your worship. Let's sing our first hymn. Rise to arms with prayer, employ you.
you please rise? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We begin with the Word of God. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing to his glory. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you, we glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O oh Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O oh Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O oh Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world. Receive our prayer. You sit at the right hand of God the Father. Have mercy on us. For you only are holy. With the Holy Spirit, our Most High in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our prayer of the day. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to destroy the works of the devil and to protect us poor people against such an evil foe. Uphold us in all affliction by your Holy Spirit so that we may have peace from such enemies and remain forever blessed. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
the Word of God before us. God's words possess God's power. Immediately after our first lesson, we will join in Psalm 40. We will sing the refrain and speak its verses. Our first lesson, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 8 through 13. The Lord calls us to be his witnesses to the truth that there is no God except him. He alone can save us from every evil. Isaiah writes, Bring out the people who are blind, though they have eyes, and the people who are deaf, though they have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let peoples be assembled. Who among them has declared this? Who has made known to us the former things? Let them produce their witnesses to show that they were right, so that people can hear and say, this is the truth. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. You are my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know me and believe in me, so that you will understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, and after me there will not be another. I, yes, I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I myself declared it. I brought salvation, and I announced it. It was not some strange God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Indeed, from the first day I am he. There is no one who can deliver anyone from my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We respond with our psalm of the day. We sing its refrain and speak its verses responsively. Patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. Were I to tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Lord, come to my aid. Lord, come to my aid. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Lord, come to my aid. Lord, come to my aid. The second of our lessons. The Word of God found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Our vocations, namely our roles and responsibility roles in life, are different. Apostle, pastor, parent, grandparent. Yet God uses all these unique vocations to put us in positions to testify to the life-giving gospel, which delivers us from evil. Paul writes, I thank God whom I serve with a clean conscience as my ancestors did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. When I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. 
Speaking to Timothy, he says, I remember your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm convinced that it also lives in you. For this reason, I am reminding you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God did not give us a timid spirit, but a spirit of power and love and sound judgment. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me, his prisoner. Instead, join with me in suffering for the gospel while relying on the power of God. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, and it has now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We speak our gospel acclamation. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Would you please rise for the gospel? The Holy Gospel for us this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. I invite your avid and clear concentration and attention. This is the one time we'll read this section through entirely. Using only his words, Jesus demonstrates his authority over the evil one. Luke writes, They sailed down to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, a man from the town met him. He was possessed by demons and for a long time had not worn any clothes. He did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. In fact, the unclean spirit had seized him many times. He was kept under guard, and although he was bound with chains and shackles, he would break the restraints and was driven by the demon into deserted places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, because many demons had gone into him. They were begging Jesus that he would not order them to go into the abyss. A herd of many pigs was feeding there on the mountain. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. And he gave them permission. The demons went out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When those who were feeding the pigs saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the town and the countryside. People went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet. He was clothed and in his right mind, and the people were afraid. Those who saw it told them how the demon-possessed man was saved. The whole crowd of people from the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were gripped with great fear. As Jesus got into the boat and started back, The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and tell how much God has done for you. Then he went through the whole town, proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We sing, Rise, shine, you people.
Jesus, freedom, light, and life, and healing. All men and women who by guilt are driven, now are forgiven. Come celebrate your banners high on and prayers against the darkness early. To all the world go out and tell the story of Jesus' glory. Tell how the Father sent His Son to Grace, mercy, and peace is yours by the power of God's powerful words. Amen. My opening title of the uh, projected theme for you, it's good advice, right? One day at a time. One day at a time. I... Think of you and think of me at this point in my life and your life and one day at a time helps. It helps with perspective. It helps with just what is. But there's more. I give you the verse of scripture where the Lord Jesus teaches us one day at a time. Okay, it's found in the Sermon on the Mount. By this point in the Sermon on the Mount, there is a turn in our Lord's directive where he is working toward wrapping up his, his message. And as he brings these words, he brings them in love and he brings them with practical concern. The full thought you see projected, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things, namely all of our earthly needs, all of these things will be given to you as well. And here's the verse that the Lord Jesus uses to teach one day at a time. Read it with me, would you? So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see how the Lord Jesus used that very one day at a time command? Yes, he addresses our concerns over daily needs, over what tomorrow or any other tomorrow may bring. He's concerned that we not be filled with the wasted time of worry over our needs. He's also concerned where we go with them. If you're going to turn to your horoscope to try to get a sense of what's coming for you, if you're going to go ahead and turn to one of the half a dozen psychics and palm readers here in Manitowoc area, well, you're not going to the Lord, you're going to the devil. Plain and simple. It was Moses who recorded the words that the secret things, they belong to God. He'll decide what he will reveal. But there's something else here. There's something else that really has been such a blessing to me and at the same time something I often miss. When the Lord Jesus teaches us to live one day at a time, where is his focus? Is he just working with the challenge of, yes, what you and I may be worrying about over the future? Or is he telling us, get rid of the worry wagon, get rid of all the ways in which you may be labored over what's to come, 
And instead, Bob, would you help with this? This is beginning to frustrate me. Go ahead and check the, the, the volume of the, uh, of perhaps me. Maybe try the uh, speaker here. We'll see if it gets rid of it. We'll see how it goes. Um, get rid of worthless worry and then be truly concerned about what you should be concerned. Do you catch that? Do you catch how the Lord Jesus sets it up? He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Is he talking about all the ways in which you and I could be ping pong balls, bouncing back and forth with just the events of our world, the events of your and my daily grind? Yes, but really no. He's highlighting at this point in the Sermon on the Mount what your and my life is to have its utmost concern. Living for our God each day. Trusting him to provide each day. Repenting over all the ways in which trouble derails us from obeying him, thanking him, praising him, trusting him. Are you with me so far? You know, what that very Satan, one day at a time, is not just a coping mechanism. One day at a time is highlighting your or my calling as Christians. Okay? And we think about that a little bit today in light of another word that's often used in English translations of this verse. If you look up English translations of, of Matthew 6, verse 34, either the word will be trouble, or the word will be, any guesses from my theme? Evil. Each, the King James, each day has enough evil of its own. That crystallizes things, doesn't it? That speaks of the battle, the battle against sin, the battle against evil in your and my life, and all that the evil one and ones strives to do to rip you away from the Lord Jesus by faith. Let's go into this fascinating section of Luke chapter 8 and witness the Lord Jesus exercising demons, but in the process, tie it together, to your and my life each day, one day at a time, powered by Jesus' words. So we begin. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Carol. Thanks. We begin with uh, the obvious. Here comes trouble. <laughs> by that, the Lord Jesus has just left the boat, and a man steps up to him. Here comes trouble. Now, I spent way too much trying, time trying to understand the uh, 24 to 48 hour sequence of these events. Both Matthew and Mark and Luke all record this exercise, this exercise demon possession and the Lord Jesus removing demons from this one individual. All three do it. All three highlight it. And it puts it very mildly to say that the day in which all this happened was busy for Jesus. <laughs> As you try to size up all three gospel records of this, either the Lord Jesus has been so busy teaching, firing away parable upon parable and so much wisdom for the soul, or he has been so busy healing Healing Peter's mother-in-law, healing the centurion's servant, healing lepers, healing and removing demons left and right, probably teaching and healing. He's been doing it all. And he is exhausted. And he gets into a boat because his day to him is not yet done. And he has them cross the Sea of Galilee, mind you, into one of those tempest storms of the Sea of Galilee. So we have the record of the first time the Lord Jesus just stood up and said, peace, be still. They wake him up, right? They wake him up. Oh, Lord, don't you care? Aren't you going to save us? He stands up, peace, be still. You can almost envision him going back to bed. And he stills the storm and he stills their hearts. Though, at this point early in their time with him, they are also looking at each other and going, who is this? 
Even the wind and waves obey him. And then he arrives on shore, and here comes trouble. Right? This guy. Matthew writes that there were two. Mark and Luke focus on one of the two. This guy. Demon possessed. Now, we could study that, and, and I could lose you, and we would lose our time together, because the fact of the matter is there are plenty of us who, who still, at this point in our world, our supposedly ordered and philosophical world, um, are ready to debate whether this is actually possible today. Of course it is. The scriptures give us time and again, again, illustrations of how, especially when the Lord Jesus was on this earth, the devil and devils had no choice but to visibly attack, personally attack. And demon possession is just that, a devil, a demon, possessing you physically. Let's not confuse this with all the ways in which we also know of plenty of things that can go wrong in the mind and wrong in the heart and emotions. And yes, they are de demonic also, but that's not the same as what Jesus is dealing with. What we want to jump to is the reality of all that the devil and demons wants to do. They are many. You heard it. This guy was filled with a whole bunch of them. They are evil through and through. Their entire goal is nothing but misery for anyone in this world. They are true to the title of the devil himself, liar and murderer. At the same time, they are not present everywhere. Only God is. At the same time, they are chained in the mystery of all what God tries to reveal to us or chooses to reveal, they have limits. They're wicked and they're powerful, but they have limits. They're more powerful than we are, but they have limits. And their entire goal is to bring us down with them. For hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, right? Remember the verse? And their attack is the fact that they, as spirit beings, are able to influence our minds and our hearts. They can bring specific messages to us, all to destroy faith in Jesus or prevent us from ever believing in Jesus at all. Okay. With that much background, we have the case before us. If you would read all three gospel records about this, it's fascinating. There's so much that has gone on and goes on. There's the reality of the fact that these two, and this one in particular, have been running around naked with graveyards as their home. They are dangerous. The people who lived near this location have done everything they can to chain them, lock them up, restrict them, and because of devil possession, the strength of these men is beyond any human effort to contain. They are tormenting the people. And here comes trouble. There he is, at the feet of Jesus, screaming, Oh, Son of God Most High, did you come to torment me? And then, in the multiple voices of multiple demons, we have, send us into the pigs. And the Lord Jesus gives permission for that. One of the writers just says, he says, go. Does he do this to show how absolutely irrational the creatures are? Does he do this to highlight the fact of how the devil's just evil, always is, and will do evil, promote evil, push evil as nonsensically and irrationally as he can. In any case, we know the result. The facts are, the result is the trouble is 
removed. Now, as that next transition in this brief account begins, I portray it to you this way. Trouble removed. Demon and demons gone. Trouble removed. Evil removed. Yes and no. Here he is. <laughs> they find him sitting at Jesus' feet. Here he is, relaxed, himself. Maybe one of the disciples gives him clothes. All is good for him. But do you notice the reaction of everybody else? They're a wreck, right? They are a wreck. They are in shock. And at the same time, we're told they are filled and gripped with fear. What's going on? Shouldn't the um, removal of this local enemy bring them only peace? Shouldn't this just help them focus on a day-to-day -day life of thanks to God? No. Why not? Well, on the one hand, the report of what happened as the spirits, evil spirits, went into the pigs gets out. And so now, whoever owns those pigs, and guess what? The number? 2,000 of them. Imagine it. Imagine it. 2,000 pigs raced into the sea. That was an economical hit for somebody. Okay? And maybe more than just a few people. More than that, this completely upsets the apple cart. It is amazing what you and I will simply cope with, what evil will be around us, and we'll get to the point of status quo normal about it, right? And this turns everything upside down. And above all, it shows the power of the Son of God Most High. And they can't handle it. They come to him and they plead with him to leave. How are we going to relate to this? I think it goes back to my attempt at an introduction. Your and my day to day is one that easily doesn't see the battle as it really is. We're easily hoodwinked by the devil and his demons and all the messages they send us, all the messages they align with all the philosophies of, a, of an ungodly world that day-to-day -day is simply just working toward the weekend, just planning and getting done what you can while you can here, making the best of what you got right here. And any interruption of the supernatural hits you, doesn't it? Shocks you, whether it's terrible tragedy or at the same time, just the fact that there are things that fall in place and you have to say, wow, God's behind this. Whenever those circumstances come, that still is unsettling, isn't it? And as we pause on this for a moment today, I highlight also the way in which you and I are experts in our daily grind to go ahead and depersonalize and departmentalize. We depersonalize all the people who are suffering. We, we see them, we may see them regularly, but after a while it really doesn't hit us. Unless, of course, the one who's suffering is you. Besides that, we departmentalize. We go ahead and in this day-to-day -day life that God would have us live for him, we turn the switch off so often and we go through our paces with nary a thought or even when we do, we work on premises of what we really would call our needs with no clue of what the Lord Jesus says our needs are. We'll get caught up in thinking that what we want is our plans to fall just right. So we are praising God for a beautiful, wonderful, glorious, nice day for a graduation party. And at the same breath, forgetting the day-in, day-out deliverance we need for our losing battle against sin. You see where I'm going? It, it's just so easy to miss the day-in and day-out true daily grind of living a life of repentance for your God. That's why they react. This is too much. We think about them often too little. And in a way, can relate. So this Father's Day, what are we going to do about it? Next slide, please. Here we have one tip. 
Would you read this with me? I think I've budgeted my time well enough. Uh, we're going to try. Here we go. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, my soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. What if you prayed this every day? Plenty of your kids did when they were in Lutheran elementary school. What if you prayed this every day? By God's word and promise, you'd see the battle, wouldn't you? You'd call him by name, the evil one and the ones. And you'd know that you can still fight this battle with the power of God's powerful words because you have the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus who accepted their rejection that day. The Lord Jesus who went on on his boat to another place and another place and another place. And he showed his power time and again. And then he showed his greatest power by willingly being powerless to assume and receive the punishment of the damned for everyone and shed his holy blood to win forgiveness for every sin as the final chapter of his holy obedient life to God every day, every daily grind day, perfectly in line with every part of God's revealed will. All for you, all for me. So that forgiveness and peace in life is yours and mine forever. To be brought back to this message and see things as they really are. Never really blowing up so much about what problems and, oh, yes, what tragedies we witness. Oh, they're terrible. But God's word helps us know what kind of world we're in. And God's word tells us, and we know by God's gracious promise, that we win in him. Which takes us to our final slide. If you pray Luther's morning prayer every day, if you see the daily battle as the Lord Jesus sums it up when he says, each day has got enough trouble and evil of its own, live a life of repentance for me, then you sit with that one who wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus sent him home. And so are you and I sent home, a place we've been blessed to purchase or a place we're blessed to rent, a place we looked at and thought, this is where we want to be. And God says, you are here for me, for your neighbors, for anyone else within your reach of your life to hear the message of complete deliverance in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the joy of the daily grind, isn't it? This pastor and his few times to be with you in worship, it's just so thankful for the fact that we have God's powerful words that will truly guard us and keep us and also set us free to share the message, the messages that save souls. And our Lord Jesus promises to ever be with us one day at a time by his powerful words. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We respond. Would you please rise? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you please bring forward our offering? You're welcome to bring it forward, Jack. Lord, bless this offering that it may ever come from hearts grateful for our salvation. Amen. We continue with our prayer of the church. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing earthly fathers. The care they give and the compassion they show are a reflection of your love. Help them in their most important work of bringing up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let your grace and forgiveness always be at the heart of their family leadership. Strengthen them to model for their children a godly life and bless all they do to provide for the needs of their families. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with so sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus who died and rose again. Amen. We journey to the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up, up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who on this day kept his promise and poured out the Holy Spirit to empower his church to proclaim the gospel in all the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
through your dear son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your son's body and blood. Send us your spirit. Unite us as one and strengthen our faith that we may praise you and your son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We respond in song. Welcome to our guests. We're so blessed to have you with us today. A couple of announcements. One, next Saturday at 2 p.m., we have a long-awaited memorial service for our saint in glory, Mr. Ron Kieselhorst. Uh, it's been planned for a long time and, and started and stopped, and God bless us that we may be able to gather this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock. There will be a light luncheon thereafter, after the service. God's blessings on your day. I guess we got cake. So you're welcome. You're, I guess you're invited to stick around. A privilege to worship with you. Thank you. <laughs> 